following is an audio excerpt from Wolves of Croton, The Untold Story of Milo, by John Abdo. Supercompensation. Remember my earlier reference to the loggerhead? Turns out it was a coincidence. Not only was catching the giant marine reptile a remarkable feat of strength, not unlike when his grandfather caught a sheetfish with his bare hands, to say nothing of Milo having the power to swim vertically to the surface using only his fluttering legs, the meaty logger had made for a deliciously replenishing meal, which we all enjoyed later on. The timing of the turtle flesh also seemed coincidental. We had been intentionally deprived of animal meat for the last two weeks leading up to these games. But on this trip, in addition to our vegetation, we ate ample quantities of turtle, swordfish, and sea bream. The premeditated deprivation had starved our muscles of protein, while the unexpected task of rowing in the galley had depleted every final micron of energy from our cells. As such, when we reintroduced nitrogenous foods to our meals, our anabolic metabolism snapped out of their starvation mode, supercompensating for the deprivation by triggering amplified melological hypertrophic outbursts. Impressively, by the time we arrived in Elias, our muscles had inflated beyond previously recorded dimensions, while Milo's proportions could only be described as outright Herculean. Many in attendance were uncertain as to which story to believe. Was Milo all hype? Were the stories exaggerated? Was Milo of Croton a mere propaganda ploy? In any case, it was obvious everybody was curious to corroborate the mystique of Milo, the son of Diotimos, the teen who was rumored to possess the strength to carry a bull. Finally, the world would have a unique opportunity to witness the most talked about human on the planet, while also observing Milo exhibiting his alleged Herculean powers inside the scamma. People were walking into posts, bumping into one another, tripping over rocks, and falling into holes. They simply could not take their eyes off Milo. Never before had they seen such a magnificent human being. Their minds had long been occupied with the supernally masculine images of the gods, but Milo was not a figment of the imagination any longer. The proclaimed mortal, son of Zeus, stood right before them in the flesh, a physical presence beyond comprehension, and what's even more astonishing, Milo was only a teen, expected to grow even larger. As our delegation marched down the walkway, in contrast with the love and adoration we were accustomed to in Croton, intermixed amongst the thousands of admirers was an obvious air of envy and animosity. Notably, the resentment was brazen and vitriolic toward all of Croton, not just isolated to Milo. I noticed many cussing at our flag, some spitting on the grounds as we marched past, and others expressing their bitter sentiments with head shaking, finger pointing, and eye rolling. More claimed that Croton had breached a sacred oath, waging accusations that Milo had not formally and consistently trained his body for ten months, and had therefore violated the very spirit of Aegon. As for Milo, to him such abrasiveness was natural. His feral nature had long conditioned him to states of antagonism and attack. In fact, little did Croton's antagonists realize that their dispositions, be they concealed or obvious, spurred the secretion of endogenous stress hormones that spewed out from their very orifices and pores, declaring their true intentions and states of mind, convictions Milo's feral attributes instantaneously honed in on. If you are enjoying this content, please like, follow, share, and subscribe, and I'll continue to bring you more fascinating information on Milo of Croton and other great mythological and mortal figures from antiquity. I'm John Abdo, thanking you for watching. Stay strong and healthy, and perhaps one day, thousands of years from now, people then will be remembering your name as well. Thank <laughs> you.